Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Evans, your host for Heroes in the Bible, Jesus. If you've been enjoying this series, please write a review and let me know how this podcast has impacted your life. Welcome to The Greatest Story Ever Told. It is a story of a shepherd's heart for his sheep, a father's love for his children, and a hero's triumph over death and darkness. This is a story that continues to shape and mold the world around us, bringing the divine heart of God right into the hearts of you and me. This episode has some of the most famous teachings and acts of Jesus. The Good Samaritan, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus all make a debut in this episode. Not only does this story satisfy our need for rich truth, but it also serves as a turning point in Jesus' ministry. Up until now, Jesus' ministry has been mostly public speaking, personal time with his disciples, and healing the sick. His miracles have drawn many crowds, and his popularity has risen. However, this episode is a hinge point where everything is going to tilt. While Jesus was still teaching and performing miracles, most of the story from here on out is about Jesus' aim at death. His squabbles with the Pharisees, as heated as they might get, are not the real battle. Jesus has his eyes fixed on a hill in Jerusalem, Golgotha. The prelude provides us with a theme to latch onto during this episode. Death is the ultimate enemy. Jesus' foe has never been the Pharisees, the religious system, or the Romans. His battle has always been against sin, death, and despair. This episode blends the traditional teachings of Jesus with foreshadows of his death on the cross. This episode is rich with amazing parables and events. However, our time afterward will be focused more on the title of this episode, Lazarus, Come Out. Join me afterwards as we unpack this beautiful story together. Prelude to chapter 13. You will not surely die, the slithering voice whispered to Eve. God knows that if you eat of the fruit, you will become like him. He cannot stand to have an equal. The serpent was crafty and knew how to deceive the hearts of people. He would entice them with the same desire he had to become like God. Adam and Eve looked at the tree. Its fruit was ripe and ready to eat. Will we surely be like God? They thought. Eve plucked the fruit and gave one to her husband who was next to her. Together, the two of them ate. With the first bite, the entire order of the cosmos shifted. They had denied their creator in search of their own power and set in motion a tragedy they could not undo. The knowledge of good and evil was upon them, and with it, their potential to sin. The eternal state of their souls shriveled into an hourglass. Death had entered the scene. The sin of pride, striving to become their own God, would plague humanity for generations to come. They would stray from God and beat against his faithfulness. The enemy death waged war against humanity. Yet God would not allow death to have the final word. His love for humanity would swing like a mighty sword. He had a plan to rescue his people from death. He would take it on himself, allowing it to consume him so his people would not have to. Chapter 13 Lazarus, come out. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs among wolves, Jesus said to his disciples. They will want to devour you. They'll revile you, persecute you. They'll spit in your direction. You must be steadfast. Seventy-two of his followers stood before him. Jesus turned to the fields of grain behind him. The rich golden ears of grain danced in the morning breeze. The bright sun rays bounced off the field as Jesus spoke. The harvest is plentiful. There are many who are ripe to hear the gospel. However, the laborers are few. There are few people willing to commit their lives to the harvest. Therefore, pray for the laborers to be sent out. The group of 72 stood before Jesus with their heads held high. 
They were a motley pack of misfits and nobodies, yet Jesus saw in them the potential to do mighty works. He was preparing them to go out in groups of two to proclaim the gospel. Jesus walked among them, encouraging them and building them up. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals. Greet no one on the road, for your course is set and your purpose is clear. When you enter each house, declare peace to them. Eat with them, dwell with them, and hear them. Heal the sick and preach the kingdom of God. If they do not receive you, brush off the dust of your clothes and move on. Jesus then sent out the 72 to proclaim the message of freedom, peace, and righteousness throughout the region. Jesus watched as every disciple left two by two. They did not know it but they were being trained. One day they would be sent out by Jesus in a different way. They would need to lean on each other and be courageous. They didn't yet understand how much power would be given to them. As they departed, Jesus ventured into the mountains. He sat on a stone overlooking the region of Judea. The wind was howling and the trees shuddered below. He was reminded of the unrepentant cities of Sodom and Gomorrah long ago. Oh, how they had rejected salvation. Any time God offered mercy, they denied it. Jesus looked upon the cities below. They had been called to righteousness, yet fell victim to the idolatry of self-righteousness. They praised him for his signs, yet rejected the authority by which he did them. They were fickle, and while many of them cheered for him now, he knew what they would be chanting next. With the wind drowning out his voice, Jesus yelled into the canyons. Woe to you, Corzin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if I had done my mighty works in the Gentile cities, they would have repented long ago. Yet they will see more mercy than you. And woe to you, Capernaum! You think you will be exalted to heaven, yet hate awaits you. Jesus allowed his voice to echo through the canyons below. The reverberating noise dissipated with the breeze. Jesus looked up to heaven, then back at the cities. He shook his head and whispered, The one who hears you, hears me, Father. The one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects you. He continued to pray to God for repentance. They were stiff-necked people, unwilling to break and humble themselves. However, Jesus loved them to such a degree he was prepared to be humbled on their behalf. Jesus came down the mountain after a few days. As he wandered back to the road, he saw the group of 72 walking towards him. Jesus smiled as he watched them laugh exchanged stories, and praised God. He had sent them out with a mission, and they were returning with a renewed sense of purpose. Even the demons fled and were subject to us. By your name they disappeared, they shouted. The disciples were elated at their newfound mission. There was a profound sense of fulfillment and bringing hope to households, healing the sick and preaching to the needy. Jesus could see the light of God upon them. He embraced them and reached his arms to heaven. Yes, my friends, it is a joy, Jesus said. However, I saw Satan himself fall from heaven like a bolt of lightning. His pride was great, and so was his fall. Listen to me, I have given you authority to bind up the enemy and tread over serpents. Yet this power is not what you should rejoice in. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He needed to remind them that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven were the humble. Great pride precedes great falls. The young lawyer was meandering around the outskirts of Judea. He enjoyed bouncing from small town to small town, attending synagogues and debating the local teachers. This hobby was an innocent one, since he was on a quest for knowledge. He was most fulfilled when he was intellectually stimulated and sought the greatest challenges the law of God had to offer. Many people followed Matthias, 
eager to watch him debate the scriptures and the philosophical quandaries of the universe. So when he had heard Jesus was in the region, he could not help but fantasize about speaking with him. Jesus was walking in the outer regions of Judea. He and his disciples would travel from village to village, preaching and healing. As he was tending to the needs of the people, the young lawyer approached him. He held himself with the arrogant glow of a student. There was an unearned confidence exuding from him. His cocky posture was showcased in stark contrast to Jesus' humble position as he mended a woman's broken foot. He approached Jesus with a crowd of eager patrons behind him. Jesus smiled at the young man and greeted him. The young lawyer went straight for his question, ready to engage Jesus in a discussion for the ages. Teacher, how shall I inherit eternal life? He asked, allowing the crowd behind him to prepare themselves. Jesus stood to his feet and wiped his hands on his robe. They were dirty from working with the people all day. He looked at the people, then walked over to a bucket of water nearby to wash his face. Well, Jesus began. What does it say in the law? You have read the law, I assume. The young lawyer was jumpy to answer, ready to begin his discussion with Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, the lawyer replied. Ah, uh, yes, Jesus answered. Very good. Do these things and you shall live into eternity. Jesus smiled and turned back to another person in need of healing. The lawyer stopped him, annoyed that he could not keep Jesus' attention. Well, then who is considered my neighbor? Certainly that varies from person to person. The lawyer retorted. It was a common question of the day, a question that certainly needed an answer. People were often wondering who they needed to love and who they were allowed to ignore. Jesus sighed and shook his head. He looked up to the young lawyer and gestured for him to take a seat next to him. He then gestured for the crowd to come in close and listen. Jesus began a story for the lawyer. It became apparent that this would not be a conversation but a lesson. A merchant was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. The road is notoriously dangerous and filled with bandits ready to jump like a prowling lion. Despite the rumors of robbers, the man decided to travel anyway. He walked the countryside with ease until that very band of robbers ambushed him out of nowhere. There was a swift blow to the merchant's head to disorient him. Then, as the man fell to his knees, another robber kicked him in the jaw. They took his money and all his supplies. When the man began to chase after them to get his things back, the robbers quickly made a mockery of him, breaking his ribs, tossing him to the ground, onslaughts and onslaughts of kicks. The robbers tore off his clothes. They took everything he owned, even the clothes off his back. They shamed him and tossed him off the edge of the road into a ditch full of stones and weeds. The man's body was lifeless for hours. Every breath was a struggle. There were moments when the man believed he was dead, only to be reminded by the pain that he was very much alive. All hope seemed to be lost, until he saw a priest walking on the road. The merchant knew he only had a few moments to make his presence known, so he yelled for help. His cries were painful, but they caught the attention of the priest. However, to the merchant's dismay, the priest looked at him and then just walked away. He could not be bothered on his way to the temple. The day was drawing to a close and the blistering sun was replaced with the cold evening air. Naked and shivering, the man was certain he would die. However, his hope returned to him as another man of God walked past. A Levite was also on his way to the temple. His elegant robes of fine color shone in the moonlight. When the Levite saw the man quivering by the wayside, he cringed and shuffled over to the other side of the road, pretending not to see him. A priest and a Levite had rejected him. All hope was lost for the poor man. The merchant knew that night would be a cruel executioner. 
so he dragged himself from the ditch onto the road. His naked body trembled in the freezing night air. In a matter of moments, the man drifted into a deep sleep. As he allowed his mind to wander, he came to terms with his own inevitable death. While the merchant was sleeping, he did not hear the slow trot, trot, trot of a mule passing by. The mule stopped, and a Samaritan man dismounted and crouched beside the merchant. The merchant was able to peer his eyes open to see a dark figure, hidden by night, lift him off the dirt and onto his mule. The Samaritan man continued into the night until he found the dim light of a nearby inn. The Samaritan paid for a room in the inn and then tended to his wounds. He bound up his broken bones and sewed up his torn flesh. Once the man was healed, the Samaritan paid the innkeeper enough money to take care of him for a few more weeks. Can you believe it? Then he returned to check up on him. Jesus concluded his story and looked at the young lawyer. With a tender smile, he said, So tell me, which of the three was a better neighbor? The priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? The lawyer was downtrodden and ashamed. The Samaritans were reviled and hated among the Jews. If there was anyone he would call exempt from love, it was them. I suppose it was the one who showed mercy, he answered. Jesus placed his hand on the man's shoulder. Very good. You are a wise man. Now go and do likewise. And with that, Jesus stood to his feet to tend to the rest of the sick. Jesus did not engage in the philosophical dialogue the lawyer had hoped. However, he gave him something that cut much deeper. He called him to a higher standard of kindness. His story revealed deep truths that had been hidden by dogma and prejudice. The Jews considered the Samaritans dogs and wretches. They were treated as subhuman half-breeds. On the other hand, priests and Levites were revered as pillars of religious morality. Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan to show that goodness, mercy, and kindness can come from unexpected places. It showed Jesus' heart that he was not concerned with cultural boundaries, but human kindness. The smell of fresh saffron enveloped the room as Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. It was a joy for the disciples to enjoy a good meal among friends. They had entered the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Their humble home proved as a welcomed respite from the brutal travel. Lazarus sat beside Jesus, sharing stories and laughter. Jesus truly cherished Lazarus' friendship. The two of them would often speak into the night about deep truths of God, exchanging jokes along the way. Jesus then transitioned into teaching the disciples. He poured into them deep truths and honest wisdom. Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened intently to every word pouring from his mouth. She was nourished by the gospel and soaked in every word she possibly could. However, reeling in the corner of the room was Martha. She anxiously swept the home, cooked the meal, and poured the wine. Worry was visible on her face as she frantically paced from room to room. Her anxious behavior was noticeable, and Jesus could tell she was growing increasingly more annoyed at her sister. Unaware of her sister's anger, Mary continued to listen to Jesus. Martha, however, boiled with anger until she burst. Jesus, are you not going to tell my sister to help me? Do you not even care that I have toiled all day on this meal and keeping the house clean? Yet she refuses to take any responsibility. Martha was getting herself worked up. She fanned her face as tears began to well up. She was embarrassed that she could not live up to her own standards of perfection, and she was bitter at Mary for seeming to not even care. Jesus gave a warm, soft smile. Martha, he said, gesturing for her to sit beside him. Martha rolled her eyes and sat beside Jesus. He took her hand and reassured her. 
Martha, you are anxious about many things. You tend to carry the whole weight of the world on your shoulders. Do not be so troubled. The only thing you need to pay attention to is what your sister is already doing. See, she sits at my feet. She listens to my words. She has chosen the correct task. Martha looked at her sister with an affectionate smile. She wiped her eyes and hugged Jesus. Then, removing the rags from her garment, she ceased her cleaning and sat at the feet of Jesus. As Jesus went around the surrounding regions of Judea, he came in contact with many Pharisees seeking to challenge his ministry. Their continual questioning often ended in Jesus shaming their lack of understanding. Yet there was a mounting hatred behind their accusations. They called him a messenger of Satan and sought to rile up the crowds against him. Lawyers joined them in order to trap him in falsehoods. Yet each time, Jesus remained a steady voice of truth. He watched as they stockpiled reputation, influence, and power. They wore their authority like finely cut gems. Although they tithed of everything they had, they refused to give to God what truly mattered, their hearts. Jesus was pondering these things as they stood in the back of the crowd. They assumed their typical position, arms crossed in the back, scoffing and whispering amongst themselves. Jesus looked to the rest of the crowd, fielding their questions on the kingdom of God. A man's voice spoke up, saying, Teacher! Order my brother to divide up his inheritance with me. Come now, who has made me the arbitrator over you? Jesus said in jest. The crowd gave a quick chuckle, and Jesus stroked his beard, preparing his response. We must guard our hearts, Jesus began. We must guard our hearts against greed, for one's life is so much more than simply his possessions. The crowd nodded in agreement. Jesus spoke a parable, saying, the vibrant and luscious farmland of a rich man produced an abundance of goods. In his pride over his work, he thought to himself, What shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. The man had an idea. He stored his grains and goods for years and years in giant storehouses. He had finally stored up so much food that he was prepared to retire and finally rest. Yet God had different plans. His life was required of him that night. God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be taken, and the things you have prepared will rot and rust away with the rest of the earth. This is the danger of those who store up all their treasure here on earth, not thinking of the eternal weight of their actions. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus turned to his disciples, understanding the worry of their hearts. It was in the flesh of every man to pursue riches, they wanted safety and prosperity for them and their families. Yet Jesus knew the true solution to a thriving heart. Do not be anxious, Jesus encouraged. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or the clothes you put on. The ravens neither sow nor reap for food. They have no barn or storehouses to store up grain for the winter. Yet God feeds them and cares for them. Rest assured you are of far more value than they. None of you worrying will add one minute to your life. If God arrays the fields with immaculate lilies, how much more will he care for the clothes on your back? The disciples were still in anguish. They did not want to care about these things, yet they still found themselves worrying. Jesus shook his head and looked at them endearingly. Oh, you of little faith. All the other nations rage against one another in pursuit of more. More riches, more power, more status. You are not of this world. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is God's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. Sell what you have and give to the needy. Invest in a storehouse that will not wither or rot with treasures in heaven. Jesus then pointed to his heart. He raised his voice for all to hear. Where your treasure is, your heart will follow. The crowd had dissipated, but Jesus remained with the 72. 
Jesus climbed up a small stone wall and sat there. They looked up at him, content to sit and listen more. Be ready, Jesus warned. Be like men who are put in charge of a wedding feast for their master, but they don't know when he'll be coming. Blessed are the servants who stay alert and vigilant. Blessed are the servants he finds attending to the needs of the household, preparing for the guests. For the servants that remain faithful, the master will have them join him to delight in the feast. He may come at the first watch, the second, or even the third. The servants do not know, and neither will you know when the Son of Man returns. Peter looked up to Jesus, curious about the parable he was telling. He raised his voice and asked, Lord, who is this parable for? Is it for all of us? Jesus smiled and hopped off the wall. He sat down among the disciples, playing with a small stone in his hand. There was a faithful servant who the master put in charge as manager over the household. Blessed is that servant if he is diligent. The master will set him over all his possessions. Jesus then threw the stone at a nearby creek bed. He raised his finger and said, However, if the servant grows complacent and says, My master is late, who cares about the feast? And then he proceeds to beat the other servants and get drunk with the wine for the feast. Woe to him when the master comes. The master will come into the feast, ready to dine in fellowship, only to find the manager of his house belligerent and drunk. His punishment will be severe. Jesus then stood to his feet and helped Peter up. He grabbed his shoulders and looked him in the eye. Peter, to whom much is given, much will be demanded. Remember this and be faithful with what's entrusted to you. Peter nodded and would remember these words. He held them close to his heart. One day, much would be required of him. And he prayed he would have the strength to rise to the occasion. Be mindful, my friends. My deeds will cast a great fire on this earth. There will be a great baptism I will endure a pain unlike any other. My soul anguishes until it is accomplished. I have not come to bring harmony between people, but a sword. Households will be divided because of me. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. They will disagree because of my deeds. For all of Christ's gentleness, he understood the weight of what was about to happen. He understood that as he stepped into the place of humanity, there would be a great divide. There would be those who clung to him as the hero of their souls, and those who chose the path of Adam and Eve, those who would cling to their own godhood. Such a divide would tear apart nations, yet in all of it there would be redemption as God's people mobilized to bring light into darkness. It was Sabbath, and Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. The entire courtyard was overflowing with people waiting to hear Jesus teach the oracles of God. As always, the Pharisees and scribes were in attendance, seeking to fire their arrows of dissension whenever they could. Many people flowed in and out of the room as Jesus spoke. Yet there was one who caught Jesus' attention, a woman who hunched over in the side of the room. She winced in pain as she sat and listened. For 18 years, she had been plagued with a crooked spine. Her agony was great, and she was in continual distress. Jesus ceased teaching and called out to the woman. My child, he said. Although the room was filled with people, the woman looked up, somehow knowing he was speaking to her. Jesus stood to his feet and opened up his arms. Rejoice, you are free from pain. And as he spoke those words, a warm sensation rose up her back like a rising tide. Her body shuddered as she pulled her shoulders back and straightened her spine. The look of joy on her face was like the bright light of heaven. Jesus rose his arms up in victory and cheered for her. The rest of the crowd joined in. The woman was in dismay and tears. She ran up to Jesus, bowed at his feet, then ran to the other women, receiving loving embraces eye to eye for the first time. The ruler of the synagogue rose to his feet. 
in rage. No! He shouted. The Pharisees also chimed in. This is a holy day. There are six days in which work can be done, Jesus. Heal your people then, but today is God's day. Today is a day where no work can be done. The ruler of the synagogue quickly regretted his words as Jesus walked off the platform and marched towards him. Jesus was kind and gentle, yet there was a righteous and humble power that dwelled within him. With the fiery tongue of God, he shouted, Hypocrites! The ruler and the Pharisees stepped back for a moment, fearful of Jesus' intensity. On any given Sabbath, you would untie your ox or donkey so that they may get a drink from the trough. You, you look at this woman, a fellow child of Abraham, and would allow her to suffer just because it's the Sabbath? Answer me, O righteous men of God! Is she not more precious to you than an ox or a donkey? The ruler of the synagogue looked at the woman, then shrunk back in shame. His religious pride had replaced godly compassion, and he knew it. However, the Pharisees' hearts were already far too hardened to care. They left, having further ammunition against Jesus. Meanwhile, in the quiet village of Bethany, Lazarus lay in bed, fighting for his life. His once lively and bright countenance was replaced by a pale shell of himself. His coughs echoed into the night, blood pouring out from his lungs. Mary sat beside his bed, holding his hand and crying. Martha brought in a bucket of warm water and dabbed his head with a cloth. It had been a week since Lazarus became sick, and his health had only declined since. Tears streamed down Mary's face as she watched her brother shiver and gasp for air. Is he going to die? She whispered to Martha. Martha sat beside the bed next to Mary. He can't last much longer. Martha paused, trying to hold back her tears. She was the strongest of the three, continually keeping the family together. However, she couldn't fix this. For all her anxiety, she could not do anything to help her brother. Mary held Martha's hand. We should send for him, she whispered. Martha nodded and went downstairs to send one of her teenage sons. Go and find Jesus, she ordered. Do not rest until you find him. The boy nodded and burst out of the door. The boy was lean and fast. He knew if he ran through the night, he could find Jesus by morning's light. Over 30 miles away from Bethany, Jesus was walking with his disciples to the synagogue. As he approached the steps entering into the home, a boy came crashing into the group. The boy fell onto his face, exhausted by the night's journey. Sweat and dirt covered his clothes. Jesus helped him up, and the boy frantically held Jesus. My Lord! He shouted out of breath. Lazarus, your dear friend! is sick and dying. The rest of the disciples gasped and stirred. Yet not Jesus. He simply nodded and sent the boy on his way. Then he began to go back into the synagogue. His disciples stopped him and asked, Jesus, why don't you go to heal Lazarus? Because this illness does not lead to death. It leads to the glory of God. Jesus replied. They were surprised at his statement. Jesus had so much power. He only needed to say a word, and Lazarus would be healed. But he spoke as if Lazarus was not ill at all. Two days passed, and the disciples were packing up their things to follow Jesus. We are going back to Judea, Jesus said plainly. The disciples were confused, since many of Jesus' enemies were in Judea. Many people were plotting in secret to kill him. Last time they were in the region, Jesus received multiple death threats. Rabbi, is this wise? The religious leaders are waiting for you there to stone you. Remember last time they sent guards to seize you? They warned. Jesus slung his pack over his shoulder and began walking. He waved for the disciples to follow. Come, we must hurry, he said. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. We are going to go wake him up. The disciples were confused. 
They were apprehensive. Jesus sighed. Lazarus is dead, Jesus said plainly. And for your sake, I'm glad I did not heal him, because now you get to see what happens next. So Jesus kept walking, not looking back to see if the disciples were following. The disciples froze. There were many violent men in Judea waiting to harm them. Thomas grabbed his walking stick, sighed, and began walking after Jesus. He turned back to the others and said, Well, I guess we're going to die with him. The men chuckled and followed Jesus to Judea. After a few days' journey, Jesus arrived in Bethany. By that time, Lazarus had been dead for days. His corpse had begun to rot in the tomb outside the town. Jesus' heart grew heavy as he approached the home of Mary and Martha. They were outside in the garden, weeping. Their eyes were red from days of tears. They looked up. Martha's gaze was piercing. You! She shouted. You should have been here. She pointed at him in pain. We sent for you and you did not come. You remained in your synagogue while he rotted away. Mary was silent, weeping on her knees and holding one of Lazarus' sashes. If only you had been here, she whispered. He would have. He. She could not hold back her tears. The women were broken. Death was a cruel thief of joy, and he had taken all of it. Martha composed herself and looked at Jesus apologetically. Uh, I am sorry, Lord. Even now, I know that you do the will of God, and whatever you ask of God will be given to you. She wiped her nose and bowed her head. Jesus hugged Martha and allowed her to cry for a while. He led her to the bench where Mary sat silently. Lazarus will rise again, Jesus said softly. Martha wiped her eyes and said, We know that he will have a life after this one. The Messiah will come and the day of the resurrection will come after him. Jesus stood to his feet and walked towards the tombs. He turned back to them. I am the resurrection and the life, he said. Whoever believes in me, even though he may die, will experience life everlasting. Do you believe this? Martha nodded. Yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the living Son of God. Jesus gave a brief smile and continued to Lazarus' tomb. The clouds were dark in the sky. The skies seemed ready to weep. Jesus approached the tomb. The stone was cold as Jesus placed his hand on it. The disciples stood at a distance, taking in the silence from Jesus. He thought of his friend, Lazarus. He was a man of joy, laughter, and wisdom. As the rain began to fall from the sky, Jesus began to weep. He slammed his fist against the dark stone. His bellows were drowned out by the sound of falling rain. Jesus looked up to heaven, connecting with the heart of his Father. This is not supposed to happen, Jesus whispered. God was the creator of life, not death. Mankind was supposed to experience life, not death. Death was a cancer of creation as a result of the fall. Death was the true and final enemy. It was the enemy Jesus was determined to defeat. The rain was beating down relentlessly. The earth seemed to be in unity with the heart of Jesus. He turned to the group of disciples with Martha and Mary. His eyes were filled with holy fire. They sent shivers down the spines of the disciples. Roll away the stone, he whispered. Peter and Andrew pushed at the large stone. It grinded against the floor, slowly opening. A crippling odor seeped through the tomb entrance. The disciples and others covered their noses and retreated back. Thunder burst through the skies, and Jesus stepped towards the tomb. He spoke for the entire group to hear. His voice mirrored the drums of thunder above. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. He looked up to heaven. Rain 
falling on his face. Father, I thank you that you hear every word I speak. You are near to my cries. Jesus planted his feet firmly in the ground and fixed his gaze into the dark and looming tomb. The clouds whirled above and lightning lit up the skies. Jesus' voice arose like a tempest. The same breath that breathed life into mankind in the Garden of Eden burst forth like a mighty wind into the cave. Lazarus, come out! The rains ceased for a moment, and there was a lingering silence. No one dared speak. Then, like a whisper, they could hear a stirring in the tomb. A small sliver of light cracked through the clouds. Jesus' gaze did not leave the tomb. The others watched in dismay as they saw Lazarus emerge from the darkness, covered in cloth. Like Adam so many generations ago, the breath of life raised him from the ground. Mary and Martha ran and embraced him. The three laughed in joy as Jesus returned to his disciples. For thousands of generations, death had had the final word. Jesus would no longer allow death to rob the joy of his creation. He saw death in an unworthy adversary. From that day forth, he set his gaze on Jerusalem. Death was awaiting its challenger. Death began with a lie. You will not surely die, the slithering voice whispered to Eve. The lies of the enemy in the garden were the beginning of the end. Life, light, and the loving relationship between God and mankind were severed on that day. Yet even in the very beginning, when the wounds of the fall were still fresh, God was promising redemption. He promised to crush the serpent's head and restore unity between him and his children. For all the miracles and great teachings we've learned about, we must never forget Jesus' primary objective, the redemption of mankind. As we have said every episode thus far, this is a story about a father's love for his children and a hero's triumph over death and darkness. The story of Lazarus was not just a miracle, but a reminder. A reminder that Jesus is still aiming at death like an archer, and he intends on hitting his target. The story of Lazarus has embedded itself in our culture. His name is known even to those who do not profess any sort of faith. This story is so layered that I thought it deserved most of our attention today. So let's unpack it together. We're introduced to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus at a gathering in their home. Martha fusses over hosting. Lazarus bonds with Jesus like a brother, and Mary sits at his feet to hear Jesus' teaching. We do not know how Jesus originally became friends with the three siblings, but we are led to believe that they have a history. They were friends and loved each other dearly. That is why when Lazarus was sick, they sent for Jesus without request. Did you notice that? They simply told him he was sick, knowing Jesus cared enough to help. However, Jesus did something I certainly wouldn't have expected from him. He delayed. Jesus intentionally waited two days before traveling to see him, knowing full well that the sickness had taken Lazarus' life. Why did he delay? What was the point of Jesus waiting? It is possible that Jesus knew Lazarus would be dead by the time he reached him. The extra delay made it so there would be no mistaking Lazarus' death. If Jesus raised him too soon, skeptics could simply claim Lazarus was never dead in the first place. Waiting created a greater chasm for Jesus to bridge between life and death. His delay was not a denial, but a decision to display more of his glory. Jesus wanted everyone to know that death had no power over him or those he loved. Perhaps Jesus wanted the sting and anguish of death to affect their hearts. It is good for us to feel the weight of grief so that we might feel the weight of comfort. The disciples asked Jesus why he didn't leave to go heal Lazarus, and he responded, because this illness does not lead to death. It leads to the glory of God. We know from past stories that all Jesus had to do was say a word and Lazarus would be healed from a distance. Jesus didn't even need to go to their house. Jesus chose to remain where he was for a while, knowing that the glory of God was going to be displayed through this event. Sometimes our suffering can be prolonged longer than we would like. Our struggles and conflicts may be extended past our comfort zones, but this too can be for the glory of God. There is a refining work in the waiting. 
If we are diligent to seek God while we wait, our minds and hearts become resilient and strong. When we are consumed with comfort, we can miss the more profound truths in life. The grief that Mary and Martha had to endure for a few days opened up their hearts to receive the truth of Jesus. In order to go to Lazarus, Jesus had to return to Judea where he was a wanted man. Entering the region was most certainly a challenge to the people who wanted him dead. This is a very important detail in the story. Jesus was walking toward death to bring Lazarus to life. In order to bring back Lazarus from the grave, Jesus had to enter a grave of his own. This is a grand and beautiful picture of the gospel. Jesus ran toward death so we could run away from it. I love the reaction Thomas had when Jesus began his journey. Thomas grabbed his walking stick, sighed, and began walking after Jesus. He turned back to the others and said, well, I guess we are going to die with him. If we choose to follow Jesus, hardships will befall us as well. We are called to pick up our cross and follow him. Jesus and his disciples reached Mary and Martha a few days after their brother's death. Morning softened their hearts like fresh rain on the earth. The soil of their hearts were fertile and ready for a miracle to spring forth. Jesus comforted them. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he may die, will experience life everlasting. What Jesus did with Lazarus was a foreshadowing of what he would eventually do for anyone who believes in him. I loved the scene where Jesus approaches the tomb. The clouds were dark in the sky. The sky seemed ready to weep. Jesus approached the tomb. The stone was cold as Jesus placed his hand on it. The disciples stood at a distance, taking in the silence from Jesus. He thought of his friend Lazarus. He was a man of joy, laughter, and wisdom. As the rain began to fall from the sky, Jesus began to weep. He slammed his fist against the dark stone. His bellows were drowned out by the sounds of falling rain. Jesus looked up to heaven, connecting with the heart of his Father. This is not supposed to happen, Jesus whispered. God was the creator of life, not death. Mankind was supposed to experience life, not death. Death was a cancer of creation as a result of the fall. Death was the true and final enemy. It was the enemy Jesus was determined to defeat. Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the Bible, but it is packed with profound truth. Jesus wept over death and despair. He is the author of life, not death. He grieves sin's effect on mankind. So with powerful determination and love carrying his voice, Jesus called out to the grave. The same breath that breathed life into mankind in the Garden of Eden burst forth like a mighty wind into the cave. Lazarus, come out. Do you hear that same voice calling out to you? Have you been lying in a grave and waiting for life? Have you been lost in darkness, depression, and despair? Hear the voice of Jesus crying out with thundering love. Come out. Come out of your sin and shame. Come out of your selfishness. Come out of the darkness and step into the light. Come out of the grave and step into life. Jesus is calling out to you and me in the same way he called Lazarus. My prayer for you as we close is that you would step out of the grave. What has been holding you back and keeping you in darkness? Hear the voice of Jesus. Be filled with his spirit and step out into the light. In our next episode, Jesus is going to take his first steps toward the grave. He did it with joy because through death, you and I can experience life. Join us next time for episode 14, The Beginning of the End. Thanks again for listening. For more inspiring stories, daily prayers, and wisdom to last a lifetime, go to pray.com. And to expand your Heroes in the Bible journey, download the Heroes of the Faith devotional at TonyEvans.org forward slash heroes. Please write a review and let us know how Jesus and this podcast has impacted your life. God bless.